Hey everyone, it is peony season, the best darn time of the year. I love this time of year in the spring. I am here to talk today about the best time to cut peonies for cut flower use. So whether you're a gardener and you just wanna bring them in to enjoy in your kitchen, or you're a producer and you're wanting to sell them at the farmer's market, whatever it might be, the stage that we cut peonies in is called the marshmallow stage. And what that means is that when I give this peony head a little bit of a squish, it should have some give to it. Uh, it should have some nice color on it and it should have a little bit of, of squish. If you looked at, let's say this one here, you can see if I squeeze that, it's pretty darn rock hard still, not quite ready to pick. I wanna cut at this marshmallow stage so that I don't lose very much vase life on the plant. I could leave this on here longer, of course, and enjoy it in the garden, but for the optimum vase life, this is where I'm gonna cut that stem. I'm gonna cut it as long as I need it, making sure to leave some foliage on the plant. I'm gonna strip all of the foliage on the stem and then put that in a vase to enjoy. Now, since I grow cut flowers for weddings or farmer's market also, I also wanna be able to store these for a period of time, which is also why I wanna make sure that I'm not harvesting too late. What I would do is cut those stems, remove the foliage, wrap them in newspaper, and I can put them in my flower cooler or in a fridge as long as it doesn't have um, other ethylene sources in there. And I can store them from several weeks up to a, a month or two. And then when I'm ready to use them, I can take them out of the cooler, give them a fresh cut, put them in water and they will open almost uh, immediately. So just be sure you're not um, harvesting too late and wasting uh, too much of that vase life while they're out in the garden. And then ants, of course, are something that we get asked a lot about on peonies. They don't do any damage to the peony. They're just there for that sugary um, kind of nectar on the opening uh, flower buds. So they don't hurt anything, not a problem. If I were to cut these and bring them in, what I would do is just cut them and dunk the flower heads in the sink and those ants would just come right off. They're not required for the buds to open. They don't do anything like that, but they do help to keep other pests away uh, from the peonies, so that's great. So don't worry about the ants, just dunk those flower heads in water if you have them when you bring them inside and enjoy your blooms. Hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener um, Specialist here for Illinois Extension and I'm based here in Central Illinois and love to chat about flowers. If you're on early, you saw me chatting about peonies uh, today, which is what I was also doing this morning. Um, so those are the questions that I love to, to answer, but luckily we have a couple of other great horticulturists with us today who have other specialties and things to talk about. So Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Candice. I'm Ryan Pancaw, um, horticulture educator out of Champaign, our Champaign office. And, um, you know, my specialty is kind of trees and arboriculture, forestry topics, woody plants. That's kind of one of, you know, my, my first favorite area, but um, I'm a big native plants person. And, you know, just kind of as a hobby, do some vegetable gardening, um, just, just to feed my family what we can out of our garden. So nice. kind of my specialty areas, but we have a new guest with us today. Mm -hmm. So Emily, would you like to introduce yourself, please? I'd love to. Thanks for having me. I am Emily Slyhart. I am the horticulturist in Milan, Illinois. So I serve Henry, Mercer, Rock Island, Stark County. And like Ryan, my specialty is, is trees and shrubs, uh, particularly native trees and shrubs. But I um, have an affinity for prairie and naturalized landscapes. 
Um, and I also dabble in vegetable gardening, you know, do a lot of um, preservation of the food and just enjoy growing pretty much everything. Haven't met a plant I haven't really loved except for poison ivy, perhaps. Yeah, valid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Emily. We're happy to have you. And thank you, everybody out there who has hopped on to join us. So we have kind of a topic. If you're new to our show, we kind of have a theme or a topic every show. And so this week, our topic is monarchs and milkweeds. So we're going to have chat a ton about that today. But you can also ask questions about anything horticulture related. So if you have a question about today's topic or about anything, Uh, feel free to add that to the chat box and we will address those as we go through today. It's been a while since we've been on, so we're excited to to be here. So yeah, usually we kind of kick off the show talking a little bit about kind of what we're up to in our our own gardens. And we were kind of chatting about that before we got started. So I, of course, have been um, all about the flowers. So I've been planting um, a ton of annuals in my raised beds, which is typically what I grow and kind of harvesting some of those spring things. So I was uh, harvesting peonies this morning. I just finished up kind of my tulip crop of of flowers. So yeah, I've been just kind of focusing on getting things in the ground, getting ready for the season. Um, How about you guys? I know we're going to talk today about kind of what's flowering in our our own gardens, but how about you, Ryan? Uh, Well, you know, I'm like, I had, I can't remember where we left off talking about our own gardens and things in the show, but... um, (laughs) I updated our vegetable garden space this year because our fence, we have a fence around it that, you know, did a pretty good job of keeping rabbits out. We have kind of a sheep pasture around that. So I don't want my sheep to ever get in the garden because they, it's amazing what they'll eat. Um, Yeah. And so that fence had to be replaced. We took it down and that was a garden space we kind of inherited when we bought the house and we've downsized it a bit because it was just, it was big. And so when we Mm -hmm. downsized, we kind of went over the existing beds and did raised beds just to make it you know, neater and nicer Mm -hmm. and just more fun to walk around in and things. And so that was a big project early in the season that finally we've got things planted, um, but it's kind of, you know, it's a change because it used to have like a little more of a rotation, I felt like going on in my vegetable garden because, you know, it's important to rotate crops where, gosh, I don't know, we went nuts and planted a bunch of onions and potatoes. So like two giant beds of that. Um, I mean, we've got greens and other things going, the typical stuff, but it's like, why do we plant so many onions, you know? <laughs> we don't need that many, but um, I, so I'm right. excited to kind of, that's that's where I'm at. It's like stuff's, a lot of stuff's went in. We just put out tomatoes and peppers and things last weekend, and I'm excited to kind of get the potatoes and onions harvested soon. I did some garlic in a spot last fall, and then just kind of have some open space to maybe you know, cover crops, some other things uh, for fall. Um, but, you know, as far as perennial gardening goes, like I've you know, we did, we were just, we're talking ahead of time. I did some weeding and things, but mm-hmm. you know, we haven't planted much new in that area. So I've kind of been spent most of the year so far, like kind of vegetable gardening, I guess, is the main thing for me. But how about you? Nice. Emily? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm jealous that you have a lot in the vegetable garden. We just started. <laughs> we're a little behind, um, but we do a lot of warm season crops out there too. So uh, tomatoes are in, peppers are in. I'm kind of waiting a little while for the pumpkins, um, you know, and the, the squash to go in. But um, mm-hmm. slowly but surely, we we um, are getting it in. We did a mulch. We re- we refreshed the mulch in our beds, um, in our perennial beds, a couple weeks ago, and that is such a huge job. We have quite a few um, beds to do, and like I'm just so glad we did it. It it makes it look nice, but it's also like extremely beneficial for the plants. And so knowing that, like all the hard work is worth it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Right. We were talking earlier how we got. I have a, a puppy in the house, and so she's been digging. And so um, there are some spots that I need to dig out some plants and replace some. But I'm hesitant because she's, you know, kind of honorary and, and she might go in there too. So she might just have a few digging spots of her own. But um, nice. Yeah, yeah that's, it's just a, that's good a delicate. Be- that's a delicate balance where the puppy can dig and not dig. We we have a yeah. puppy that's. I mean, we still call her a puppy. She's like probably a little over a year now. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like our, she's kind of loose just in her backyard amongst the landscaping beds and. It, yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind of like they've started to dig in that spot. They like it. Maybe I should just let them have that little area for a while, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, you know, like they're part of the family. And so like one of the the decisions that we've made is that they will probably like last year, our other one was like rolling in my big blue stem. And I was just like, <laughs> oh God, like just <laughs> knocking it down. But again, he's yeah. one of the family members and, you know, he was hot and he didn't, he wasn't being, you know, 
um, intentional about knocking things over. But so that's our approach to gardening. Of course, there are um, different approaches and different tolerance levels, but right. we love them. So. Well, an exciting, an exciting thing our puppy did the other day was came up with a mole she had caught. Oh, that would so, be handy. <laughs> that yeah, is handy. I was, I was like, go puppy. Yeah, you know, keep it up. This mole out of here. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, cool. I think she's a keeper. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, hit us with your questions in the chat box. I think we'll kind of get started on our topic for the day, which like I mentioned is monarchs and milkweeds. So most of you, I'm sure if you're watching this today, you kind of know what that is and what we're talking about. But monarchs, of course, are a butterfly species that has gotten a lot of attention here lately, certainly in the last couple of years, for sure, uh, because it's an endangered species that we're doing a lot of kind of conservation efforts are. And there's things that you can do in your own garden to kind of help that that species of butterfly. And then, of course, what we know uh, based on that is that we need milkweed plants um, in order for the monarch to complete its life cycle. So I know we're going to talk through kind of some of those uh, milkweed um, species, but do you guys have any any kind of intro to add on kind of the importance of monarchs or why, why is it such kind of a, <laughs> a big topic that we talk about lately? I mean, I think it's kind of interesting when you look at like how the problem evolved because, you mm -hmm. know, milkweeds are this, are a weed to so many mm -hmm. people. You know, we're like all, all of us, we were talking about before the show, like we garden with milkweeds now, right. you know, like where a bunch of my family here in central Illinois farm for years. And, you know, like my grandpa does probably doesn't understand why you'd want to plant a milkweed. So, um, you know, so there's interesting like research. We kind of, we talked about a paper with the hit from the history survey here locally that looked at kind of milkweed populations around the state and, and you know, what are they doing and, and kind of frame the problem and they, yeah, in all those agricultural areas, milkweeds are gone. We've, de we've become awesome at controlling those weeds, you know, mm -hmm. and so their populations have declined where in natural areas, they seem to be holding steady or even getting better because all of us are starting to pay attention. We're starting to add natural areas. We're starting to manage those better. Um, you know, invasive species are a big pressure on milkweeds in some of the natural areas they exist in because it's kind of in that plant successional stage where there's a lot of openings for other plants. Um, and so invasives tend to take take over on that. So as we identify more invasives and natural areas managers get better at them, I think there's a, a bright future for milkweeds in like a lot of our restored areas, but that doesn't mean there's sufficient numbers to support all the monarch larvae that are out there that, that need it. So to me, that's why, you know, our garden space has even become really, you know, important at this point. Yeah. And I'd like to frame, you know, the conversation every time I talk about monarchs, they're like the poster child for, um, you know, yeah. the like pollinators, right? The plight of the mm -hmm. pollinators, because they are stunning. They're easily identifiable. Um, you know, they, they do have that kind of nice, story of needing, you know, we can latch on to actually having tangible, actionable yeah. know, things to do, which is put milkweed into our landscape. Um, they're also, you can track them, right? Science can track them a little easier because of their migration patterns, you know, and measure population, you know, and it was really a stark decline that we were able to see, um, you know, just literally see, right? Sometimes things really need to hit us in the face. And that, that did that visual, um, you know, that count of the decline of you know, overwintering monarchs in Central America and um, Southern California, you know, it's it's a it's not alone though, right? That's not the, these aren't the only species that are suffering. You know, they are the poster child, and so I guess, um, man, I love monarchs and like we rear them, and they're easy to you know to rear and identify, and it's fun to you know be able to do some citizen science that way. Um, but as we go through this, I guess I always like to just put that little caveat on there where like, they're not the only pollinators mm -hmm. that, you know, are needing some attention and needing us to take some action in our landscapes. And, and there's different ways we can do that. But, um, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I feel like you could say the same for like the honeybees, the poster child of the kind of the pollinator yeah. um, mm -hmm. movement too. But in reality, there's so many of our native bees that are going through the same, same kind of struggles. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just globally, you know, all oh, yeah. pollinators are in trouble. And we know that yeah. from lots of papers we could cite over the last decade right. that have shown that just worldwide. And I right. mean, it's, you know, it's an issue for all of us because 
you know, I love the statistic of like one in every three bites you eat, a pollinator is responsible for. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that really hits home. But, right. you know, like somewhere on the order of 75% of all flowering plants rely on pollinators for their reproduction. Mm -hmm. You know, so even at natural ecology, you know, is, is really it's, you know, threatened like globally, you mm -hmm. know, by, by this decline in pollinators. So, right. Yeah, I was reading time. earlier too, it, it hadn't ever struck me. So that, that number, right. Of, you know, three quarters of every, of uh, every flowering plant depends um, to some degree on pollinators, right. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, there's different varying um, degrees, but um, from an economic standpoint and a food security standpoint, um, it, it, is less in count because we harvest and consume so many of the wind pollinated like corn and wheat wind pollinated um you know food products but think of the variety that we'd miss like we'd lose avocados we would lose right. apples we would lose you know pumpkins we just like the the great variety is um so I, I i was reading that and it really struck me um i hadn't fully connected those dots before where it was that percentage might is, is significant in that the variety that we would be having available is would be significantly right. reduced. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And it's not like monarchs are uh, super efficient pollinators. <laughs> yeah. Not, but we can, we can talk about that, how like butterflies are certainly, they do a little bit of pollinating when they're going from flower to flower, but they're not going to be as, as effective kind of pollinators as some of the bee species or, or other things, but yeah, they're, still, they're not, the, still they're not the workhorses of the pollinator world. But yeah. I, mean, I think of bees as that, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, honeybees, we always talk about too. They're not native, you know, there, there's right. so many native species of bees. And I, I don't know, like in the state, I mean, hundreds of native species mm -hmm. of bee to Illinois that, um, you know, just have like unique and different lifestyles and, um, than honeybees, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just, uh, I think they often go overlooked, overlooked. I mean, you know, many of them are ground nesting, you know, so that's an important aspect of like a pollinator garden, you know, is, is having spots of open, open soil. And I didn't understand that ever. Mm -hmm. Now I'm mm -hmm. starting to, I'm really going for like, well, Emily, I, I just did some updating of mulch too, but mm -hmm. you know, mulch is maybe something that blocks some of that area. So yeah. like, well, I'm, I'm mulching areas that are kind of still need, to be filled in, my hope is that someday all those plants can intertwine mm -hmm. and be thick enough that I'm not needing to mulch much. And that right. gives me some of that bare soil surface where I have areas like that in my landscaping where it's like, okay, I don't need much mulch there. And I mean, it, there's just so many things in like all of our gardening practices that we can, that you just don't even think about doing. And I, I mean, I think something we've talked about a lot in this show is like that spring cleanup time. Mm -hmm and delaying it because lots of things use lots of stems of plants. Um, yeah. So there's just a million concerns with, with pollinators in general. Um, you know, I, I guess an interesting conversation I just had was with uh, Sarah Hewson, one of an, you know, an entomologist on campus that works with our, our pesticide safety and education program. So mm -hmm. she does a lot of, you know, stuff related to that program. You know, they offer pesticide licensing uh, clinics and things, but she did an article for the Home Yard and Garden Pest Newsletter, which mm -hmm. if folks don't know about that, um, that's put out, I guess it's maybe every two weeks. Is that right? That sounds about right. Yeah, we'll see if we can get a link in, throughout, the, in the chat yeah, for that. Throughout yeah. the growing year, you, you can subscribe to it so you get an email each time they post it, but she did one on... Um, I can't remember the exact title, but it was like pesticide safety and pollinators or, mm. you know, spring practices to protect pollinators. And some of it relates to, yeah, like pesticide use. So that's something that, you know, impacts pollinators, you know, some of our, and so I just, I just chatted with her kind of about that article and it, you know, started with an email. I was like, Hey, that's a great article. You know, I love those topics. Um, mm -hmm. But just thinking about, you know, why is use to pesticides if you're using it around the garden? Um, one thing I never thought of that she brought up when we were chatting is just like a lot of those weeds that might flower that you're going to spray, don't spray them when they're flowering, you know, get to right. them ahead of time because pollinators are on those blooms and they can get exposed to pesticides. Um, you know, just trying to go for less pesticide use is usually what I'm mm -hmm. looking for, but um, timing of that application, like, you know, pet, pollinators are less active, you know, definitely after dark, but mm -hmm. um, pesticides are not as, 
at, you know, active. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like the dusk and dawn time periods is the days winding down. Like I, I typically go for kind of dusk or I mean, dawn where, you know, the yeah. day's getting ready to start. The plant's going to start photosynthesizing and, you know, utilizing that uh, pesticide then once, once it gets going, but mm-hmm. um, trying to think of some of the other things you mentioned, but it's just a really good article and kind of a reminder on a lot of this stuff that nice. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read, I haven't read that one. I'm going to have to go back and and look at that one. But yeah, it brings up a good uh, point. Maybe this is where we can kind of get into next. Like what are some of those things we can add to our gardens or change our practices in our gardens that can help not only monarchs, but kind of everything in general. And you mentioned pesticides, of course, that's a, that's a big one. And I think in the spring, one of the biggest areas to think about is your lawn when it comes to that, because I mean, we're going to talk about some milkweeds here in a second and how really they're kind of hardly out of the ground at this point. There isn't a lot, there isn't a lot happening. So you have to think about, okay, are there any other flowers that I have in my garden or in the lawn that can provide kind of those nectar sources uh, or pollen sources early in the the year? So for me, uh, they're about done now, but a couple of weeks ago, I mean, my lawn was just a sea of color with vi- violets and uh, dandelions just filling the whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, this is great. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but then, you, you know, you talked about kind of the old school farmer and kind of the old way of thinking about weeds. My dad comes over and he's like, what are you doing? What is all this? <laughs> you need to get rid of all this. And I'm like, hey, if it's green, it's good. And I think that's where a lot of people are starting to realize it's like you kind of have to think a little bit differently about getting some of those flower sources in the spring. Yeah, one thing I, I don't know much about, but I ran across recently is like the bee friendly lawns. Yeah. Have you seen that where it's kind of a weird yeah. combination of shorter fescues that are kind of, you know, kind of like the no-mo lawns mm-hmm. and like, you know, time, like uh, creeping time, you know, something that flowers. I forget there's a few other things in the mix, but I'm super interested mm-hmm. in that as kind of an alternative. And I'm starting to look at some areas like as an alternative to mowed turf, I can add some things. Right. Well, and I've seen a lot of headlines lately about no mo may too, which yeah. is if you have a traditional mm. lawn, it's not probably the 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 route to go, but it's something to think about. <laughs> like you might need to change up your species a little bit, but yeah, yeah, I think some of that started a little north of here, the no mo may thing, because it's yeah. really hard probably to make it to this point in May. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've only mowed like once, you know, where yeah. I, I've got a neighbor that I don't, I can't count the times, you know, mm-hmm. probably have already been mowed. Um, right. Yeah. It's pretty Just hard about to delay to roll a May. Yeah. yeah. With the early season um, blooming plants too, though, um, trees, we, we often mm-hmm. don't talk about trees as being those very first pollinate or very first um, food sources for pollinators. And so, um, you know, I, I outed myself as a tree person. And so I always have to put in a plug for trees, but mm-hmm. um you know, a lot of them have already bloomed and they're done. You know, those were, um, they were, you know, popping right as soon as the pollinators were starting to emerge as well, um, right after the thaw, which seemed like it was late this year. I don't think it yeah. actually was, it just was cool. But, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of great native, you know, trees that are blooming and, um, you know, very early yeah. service berry, um, crab apples, everybody, you know, loves. Um, they, you know, I like later in the season too, like the linden. I don't know if you guys have ever like walked by a mm-hmm. linden and it mm-hmm. just is like alive. Like it's kind of, it's, it's startling. Um, mm-hmm. If you're not expecting it, I was, I had an experience in a, in a community we walked by and it just was like, you know, Lord of the Flies kind of sound where you're like, <laughs> it's just, it yeah. was a living tree and there was just all the pollinators on it. And so they were not interested in us and we were interested in them, but harmless kind of relationship. So. Right. You know, one of those trees I've noticed like in central Illinois, that's just a, a blaze with blooms right now is black locust. And mm-hmm. yes, it's not one you think of as this like awesome tree for much of anything because yeah. it's early successional. It invades disturbed sites. It just yeah. pops up lots of places. But gosh, it was hard to hard to miss. Like I, I went to Danville to our Vermilion County office um, earlier this week for a program and just coming into Danville all along the interstate, it was just this corridor of uh, black locust and you know it actually it has a ton it supports pollinators in a ton of ways if you look at all the things that use its flowers mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, you know larval forms it supports and and other things it's it's a big plant and and same with linden um mm-hmm. just if you look at what all it supports where as an arborist you know i kind of talked bad about linden a lot because 
it has you know kind of poor branching structure mm-hmm. you know yeah. it, it well has japanese beetles just japanese love beetles. it too but yeah. gosh as a pollinator plant it is just spectacular you mm-hmm. know so another one arborists are like mm. But in the right place, it's really great for pollinators. Is willow? That's another one that can mm-hmm. just you know in a in a back forty or in a park setting. Um, willows are really great for pollinators too. And so, um, Doug Tal and me had done done all that research. I'm sure you guys have heard of them, but I want to make sure you know the viewers know of, of the research he's done. Like it's just incredible, um, you know, how many species use the different you know, native trees like oak, and this is for their whole life cycle, of course. And so, oaks being wind pollinated is not. A primary um, food source, but habitat-wise, you know, they're supporting over 500 different species. You know, it's um, he's out of Delaware. It just is worth looking at if you're considering a tree. Like it, it is, um, it's, it's stunning. You know, yeah. Uh, he, he wrote a whole book on oaks that I yeah. got for Christmas, and I'm part way through reading right oh, now. Oh, nice. So, I mean, fascinating to like mm-hmm. hear of all the insect species they support, and you know, it, it, you know, according to him. It, it, an entomologist, a PhD researcher mm-hmm. in entomology, like the single best native plant you could plant for insects is an oak. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I didn't think of it that way before, you know, I right. always valued them as cool trees, but didn't think. Yeah. Of them when we go to, yeah. so often we go to just flowers. Oh, we need flowers for pollinators, which is true, but there's so many other insects too that need support. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think cherries is on the list. I think that's, a, you know, the black cherry, like is a really big, tree that's never I don't think planted quite as much as it should be perhaps um mm-hmm. if your if your goal is to help pollinators and yeah okay well don't be afraid to ask questions in the chat everybody I see we had one earlier um Marie was asking um how do I plant New Jersey tea you guys have any tips on planting New Jersey tea well, we, we talked about that plant a little bit earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's in the background of one of the pictures I have. I may shave, show later, but cool. um, as far as how you plant it, like I've always done it from like a potted kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, you know, whether yeah. it's a little four-inch pot or I think the most recent ones I planted were like gallon size. But mm-hmm. I guess the biggest issue I've had is like when it's little and young, rabbits just hammer mm-hmm. that in the first winter especially. But when it gets a little bigger, it's like, maybe the stems are less palatable or something. So I guess that would be the first big recommendation I would have is like, at least for that first winter or two, put a little cage around it if you have rabbits. Um, but I don't know, what else have you guys seen with? Yeah, I played in mine from a plug, so a little small on a four inch. Um, I wouldn't really recommend that. I don't intend to do that again. Um, it just, you know, being a shrub, being- Take a while. It, it takes, yeah. It, yeah, it takes a while to, to grow and get some size on it. And so- um, Mine got a little bit lost in the landscape because of that. I, I planted it with other like native plugs um, mm-hmm. that grew really quickly because um, they were they're perennials. Um, but protect it. I lost mine. I told you guys this. I lost mine to rabbits this year, and I'm kicking myself because I didn't protect it. Um, that was that was human error. But we'll replace it with a a pot. I think that's a better better strategy. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it as like three or five gallon pots too. Like mm-hmm. we just got the little mm-hmm. one gallon, but yeah, I would have liked to have even had probably a little bigger one, mm-hmm. just to get it just to get it up above that rabbit browse soon enough, mm-hmm. you know, or big or just bigger. I think it's just thicker stems that are less, you know, tender and delicious is what mm-hmm. what makes yeah. it a little more resistant. But yeah, yeah, I think mine started as it might have been a three gallon. It, I got it pretty big from a local. Um, native plant sale and it's yeah mine's doing good I was telling you earlier the this year the above ground portion kind of died back usually I, I uh that doesn't happen so I kind of had to cut, go in and cut out some of that growth but it's leafing out fine and I think it'll be fine but yeah yeah you know fire adapted prairie species so it should, right? exactly. it should have all its top it, all of its top growth can be consumed and should come back exactly. but yeah as far as a pol- pollinator plant it's a super cool one so oh yeah kudos to the yeah. viewer that planted that I mean, what is it like about a month of blooming that you get out of it or maybe more? Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Of time. Pretty good. Yeah. So. Cool. So yeah, if you haven't planted a New Jersey tea, give it a give it a try. Um, let's see. Phyllis asks, what author on the oak book was that Doug Tallamy yep. you were talking yep. about, Ryan? Yeah, and I think it's just called Native Oaks or something. It's something real simple, but it's like okay. I think it's his most late, his most recent book that um cool. 
You have a perfect Christmas present to me from somebody. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> I don't have that one, so that will be on my Christmas. Yeah, I don't either. And then, or just, I um, might just buy it for myself. I can't wait till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> patience is not one of my, or uh, patience is not a virtue of mine. <laughs> he's got a lot of great books, though. So if you do ever stumble across any of his, like he's he's just a wealth of knowledge and stuff. And mm-hmm. engaging, too. He makes bugs fun. So. Yeah. yeah, I think his first book really frames the problem. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So bringing Nature Home. Bringing Nature Home. Yeah. That. Yeah, and that's, that's what really kind of spurred some of my interest in native gardening, gardening with natives. You know, I, I came from... You know, kind of like some of my landscape background came from being an arborist where, you know, I think of my early career, I don't know that I really differentiate a lot between native and non-native because I worked in, you know, the built environment, the, you know, the built landscape. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the thing. I think that's probably one of the most influential things on me that really made me think, oh, my gosh, my most of my yard should be native, you know, and I need to be going that route. Yeah, yeah. that's a good yeah. one. I've got another one too. Um, it's called the living landscape. If people are looking at how to bring oh, it yeah. into and you know it into a more formalized landscape, be good. And it's the nature of oaks. The nature of oaks. Yeah. Okay. Nature. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Okay. Let's see. We got one other question here. Um, Susan says some of my boxwoods have boxwood leaf miner. For the boxwood leaf miner, I've done some spring pruning on infested leaves, but what is the next step? I think I read that spinosa works on the adult stage, but when and how? I do not have my pest management book handy. <laughs> do either of you yeah. kind of know? I probably the... do. Yeah. No, and that's one that I haven't dealt with directly. Um, so I don't know. Emily, would you have any uh, any thoughts? I don't. I, I don't have a lot of experience with, with boxwood in general. It, I'm not native and so haven't come across it. Yeah, the, the book I'm referencing is just uh, pest management and the hope for the home landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's kind of a, it's put out by extension. It's kind of our go-to recommendations for you know what you're going to do for any of these pests. So you can look up kind of by by pet, by the individual pest in the index. Mm-hmm. Um, so here, give me a sec. I'll just see what I can. What I can yeah, close. maybe Susan will will add that to the chat box when we figure out what the what the recommended is. But yeah, always good to check that source. (laughs) Okay, well, while Ryan's doing that, let's get in. I think we've caught up on questions, so keep those coming in the chat box. Um, Let's get into some of the milkweed species, because obviously we said the uh, for monarchs specifically, they need uh, milkweed species in order to complete their life cycles. So they lay their eggs on it, their larvae feed on it, and then they make their chrysalis also on <laughs> from that uh, plant. So we need some type of uh, milkweed species to be in that area. And there are numerous. So I'm going to share some pictures here to get us started. And then we can all kind of talk about um, some of the different species. So my favorite species of milkweed is butterfly weed. So Asclepius is the genus of, of, of milkweed. So all um, milkweeds are going to be Asclepius, but tuberosa is the uh, specific epithet here for butterfly weed. But it is by far my favorite because, well, one, it's a beautiful landscape plant. So you can see these beautiful orange flowers, which is very unique when you compare it to the other uh, milkweed species. And you can see there's a monarch larva on there as well. And we could probably find some research studies on, and I know there's some that are going on even at, at on campus on kind of what monarch species provide kind of the most amount of support in terms of, uh, of monarchs. I don't know that butterfly weed is probably the top kind of most, most beneficial, and we could get into that maybe. But man, I always have lots of, of larvae on mine, especially late in the summer. And you can see it here. It's this orange flower uh, towards the front. So it's a shorter plant, maybe 12, 18 inches tall max. So it makes for a nice kind of edge of the landscape um, addition. And then, of course, it'll have those um, nice orange flowers. And then here's another monarch uh, larva there feeding on that foliage. And that's another thing we can talk about, too, when we get into these species is that if you're planting milkweeds, you kind of are planting it with the knowledge that there may not look great <laughs> all season long. One, they might get eaten down. I mean, sometimes there's barely any foliage left on, mm-hmm. 
on these just because the there's so many larvae, which is great. That's your that's that's what you want, right? Um, but you'll also find too that there are many other insects that are also attracted to milkweed species. So on the right, there's some, I think those are milkweed bug, um, um, a stage of the milkweed bug there that's gathering on the seed pods. Aphids, of course, are very common on all of the milkweed species. So we can get into like, do we control it? What do we do? What's the, <laughs> what do we do about that? But that's just part of having a milkweed uh, in your garden. And then of course, you're going to find those chrysalis then popping up anywhere in that surrounding area. So these are little decorative things that are kind of on the wall behind those plants. One year, one did it on the garage door and I was like, oh, wow. guys, this is probably not the best, <laughs> the best location for doing this. Um, but yeah, it just when you plant milkweed species, you kind of uh, come to understand that that might might happen. But yeah, so that's my favorite of the milkweeds is, is butterfly weed. And it is fairly common one, I would say at garden centers nowadays, more than, more than it used to be. So I was able to find a little four inch pot of it at um, a local garden center the other day. Um, I do recommend if you are going to plant this and honestly, any of the milkweeds, um, if you do want to start it from a plant, a small plant, do start with a small plant. They don't necessarily transplant the best. So you're, and you're probably not even going to be able to purchase like a one gallon or a two gallon big plant at the garden center. That wouldn't be the way I would, I would go. That's going to struggle probably to get established in your garden. I would start with a smaller plant like this or plugs even, um, or even by seed too would be the be the way to go. So you know, one one thing I you know, butterfly milkweed is one of my favorites too, and I I just love how it's um you know it's not huge, it's little, it can kind of fill in. Um, it spreads a little bit, and you okay. know I, I don't want to say yeah. that as a negative, right? Because it's not an aggressive spreader necessarily, but it it pops up around my garden and um. And I, I like that lots of spots that it's popped up, it can kind of fit right between the plants that are there. Right. And you get that, you know, almost a, a whole summer of blooms really out of mm -hmm. it. Uh, but I have noticed like the little ones that pop up that are kind of in a path or something. And I try and move, like I try and get them really quick and early, you know, like right now. Yeah. And I'm kind of grabbing those because, you know, later in the season as an afterthought, I've moved some that just didn't, didn't yeah. take or didn't. So I, I, yeah, I get the feeling too, Candice, that like milkweeds aren't, the most transplantable things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my experience too. Except for with my uh, swamp milkweed. Those suckers, mm. I don't know if it's... I put them in a wet spot, of course. They, they're more yeah. tolerant of wet sites. And that's kind of the beauty of milkweed is that there's a ton of different um, species that can fit basically any any site that you have. Right. Um, but so um, one thing... Nobody's going to want to do this, so I'm going to say it anyways, um, is to, in that first year, to help them get established is to not let them go to flower. Um, mm -hmm. to help, you know, don't don't let them take all that energy to, to produce flowers, even though those, you know, like orange flowers, or the, you know, the, the rose-colored flowers and some of the other ones are white, are, are stunning. Um, that could be a strategy to help perennials get established. And so... Yeah, that's um, a good point. I lost yeah. my, my milkweed, so I think I might actually try that this year. Nice. Well, so yeah, I, someone. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say, I'm a huge fan of swamp milkweed too. I really like that one. Um, yeah, got, let's talk. Let's talk about that one. That was another one that was not again not very big in the pot, but just starting to come up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little taller. It gets to be a bigger plant, um, mm -hmm. it has kind of pinkish flowers for definitely not as long as butterfly weed, but still pretty yeah. good chunk of flower bloom time. But uh, fragrant flowers that you can actually smell yourself. So that's kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. It's a taller plant, so I, I like it in the spots where it needs to go, but um, for a taller size plant, but um, there's been a little bit of research that's looked at, you, you know, utilization and preference of, on monarch feeding of the different milkweed species. And while, yeah. you know, there's not a paper that really shows us all of those together in a big picture, in some of the snapshots, of that swamp milkweed has been a favorite, um, mm. you know, so that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I've kind of tried to promote it in spots or plant a little bit more of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's because a good, monarchs that's, like it. So that, that's something to think about. There's a, maybe a feeding preference amongst the different species. And so, right. um, 
you know, again, a little more feeding on that plant is a good thing. So don't mm -hmm. necessarily discount that plant because of that. Right. Well, and I've observed, you know, even like the size of it helps to kind of mitigate some of that, that feeding pressure mm -hmm. too. Like it doesn't have that aesthetic. And so if you're looking for a plant that looks nice and is also being chewed on, um, you know, having that bigger plant can, can kind of help offset that, that destructive yeah. look. Totally. Yeah, because yeah, like yeah. I said, sometimes that butterfly weight just gets totally stripped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of them, which is fine, like I said, but it definitely, you notice it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The swamp, too, you know, speaking of, of aesthetics, like, um, I like the the bloom of it. I, I compare it also to common milkweed, which is, um, you know, got that kind of like ball-shaped um, mm -hmm. bloom structure or arrangement. It's more humble, and I, I like that. I, I just, I guess mm -hmm. I something to know that there's some choices with, with yeah. the structure of the, the blossom also. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into that one next. So we've talked about butterfly weed. We've talked about swamp milkweed. How about common milkweed? I would say obviously the name implies that one is also fairly common uh, out there. Any comments on that one? Yeah, well, we we talked about that a little bit before. Um, I, I've got a little patch of it going in my backyard um, that started as like a single plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's a spreader. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, um, it, it gets taller. Um, it has really pretty flowers on it, um, but it's not quite as multi-stemmed as swamp milkweed, you know, where you mm -hmm. have more of kind of a single plant. So a little different look, you know, where swamp yeah. milkweed, at least in my garden, it kind of spreads out and it's bigger, um, you know, uh, common milkweed is just kind of more of a couple stems that are coming up. Um, but it's, it's almost, so what I really like about it right now in my garden space is that it's up and it's a plant right now. You know, it's, it's really emerged um, mm -hmm. and, and grown where I can hardly find a sign of butterfly milkweed or swamp milkweed. Those are probably the only three I really have in cultivation. So that's great that it's here. It's, you know, it's ready for monarchs to lay their eggs on. While I haven't really observed activity yet, it's there and, and ready where the other two aren't. But I kind of don't like the way that it's spread in the area mm -hmm. that it's at in my garden. And it's not really through seed. It's, I mean, I guess maybe it's probably a little bit of seed we've let happen, but um, naturally has spread. And so really kind of starting to think about, do I want this patch to expand more or do I want to try and keep this plant contained? And, you know, which, you know, which of these species in cultivation do I want to focus my efforts on as far as, you know, milkweeds? Right. Go? And I'm not sure yet. I'm still kind of thinking about that. Right. So uh, common milkweed, unlike some of the other milkweed species, is that it will um, spread by seed, of course, but it also spreads by rhizome. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the the reason you get these patches is part of the you know the um, the success of the plant right? It, right it is able to reproduce in a number of, of ways and so um, if folks are getting those those patches or if you see those develop in you know a naturalized area that's partly what's happening it's not just that the seeds are are falling nearby it's that the root system is helping to propagate the plant and um, grow a bigger bigger mm -hmm. mix of it and so. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's certainly what certainly what's going on in my space because mm -hmm. we we actually harvest some of those seeds and then you know grow those. And my my wife does kind of a little program where she grow, grows little seeds, little milkweed plants to give away or sell at the farmers market. So um, nice. so anyway, I I know there's not a ton of seed going down, so I'm pretty sure that's what our spread is from. Sure, but, you know, different with butterfly weed, I don't feel like it's really ever spreading from from mm -hmm. roots. It's it's mm -hmm. seeds that are getting out that um same with yeah that. yeah and that was one of the one of the questions that came in debbie asked um does butterfly weed, but does butterfly weed need to be contained in a bed are they invasive and i would say on the scale of spreading to non-spreading butterfly weed is probably the least spreading at least in my personal yeah. experience i'll have it kind of pop up occasionally but you know, it's pretty rare for mine to um for mine to spread, yeah. But it's some of that spread that I'm kind of like delighted by. It's like, oh, right, exactly. Butterfly weed there. It's not, yeah. yeah. And if it does, it's not aggressive. Like I'm like, yeah. oh great, that's yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, let's see. Susan asks. I'm guessing by the name that swamp milkweed can tolerate poorer drainage. Yep. Did you say that's correct? Yeah. Yeah, definitely can tolerate it. I mean, I've got it in a spot that's not really poorly drained i mean there's you know it's kind of mm -hmm. a, normal, a normal spot if there is normal yeah yeah i would say it's pretty adaptable it doesn't have to have yeah. that super wet area but it can tolerate it 
Yeah. Right. Where I put mine is um, where are some pump drains. And so it get, it does have like seasonal wetness. Nice. Um, but then it also dries out and I don't irrigate because I have other things to do. So that's the right. landscape approach again that I'm taking, which is <laughs> you have to be able to survive kind of the variety that, that Mother right. Nature throws at you. So yeah, yeah. Good, point. Is a good one. Cool. And then Marie also asks, um, some people have water gardens. Would swamp milkweed work in those areas? Well, not in standing water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's on the edge. edge. Yeah, mm-hmm. the edge of a pond, I think, would would work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah in nature, it's kind of a wetland plant. Is you know the spot where you see it a lot is on on the mm-hmm. wetland fringe, but not not really where there's standing water for very long. Yeah, yeah. Good questions. Okay, what about? I mean, those are three milkweed species. There are numerous more. Do you guys have any <laughs> any others that you'd like to add to your garden? Well, I put in world milkweed. It's a little more delicate and it's, it's smaller in stature. You know, the, the leaves are much smaller. It's world, like mm-hmm. as the you know, common name implies. So the leaf pattern is that it goes around the stem on um, yeah. the world pattern, which is unique. Um, it, you don't eat, walk up to it and think there's a milkweed. So that, you know, that's kind of a fun trivia to mm-hmm. tell your neighbors at the garden party. But um, it also spreads. It's easy to control, um, but it does, it, it does like to creep around the garden. Um, I had the most success rearing monarchs off of this one. Again, it got des- desiccated. Like it just was like destroyed by the the feeding larva. Um, I was fine with that, but we found the most most eggs and most um, caterpillars on that that plant. So nice. another nice one to try. It's white um, in in bloom too. So unique from you know, the mm-hmm. butterfly milkweed and the commoner swamp milkweed. So yeah, what's the how tall does that one get? ish it's not very big um yeah again mine suffered a massive attack from monarch <laughs> but only got about a uh, foot and a half but um, yeah yeah that's good though yeah yeah cool okay well definitely tell us in the chat if you have other um species that you've tried and that you like keep those questions uh coming but emily you mentioned kind of rearing monarchs so let's get into kind of the the insect of it all. Um, what can people do to kind of help the actual monarch? Like, is rearing them helpful? We talk, we we have projects to tag them. What do you? What would you say there? Yeah. So in my mind, there's there's kind of like the two levels of um, how to help monarchs. So there's yeah. like the garden part, right? Like there's yeah. the it's more of a hands off approach. Like you plant the the plants and you have those available to monarchs. Um, and you protect them and you're careful about using chemicals in your landscape, which we can talk, you know, in greater depth about. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like the outside activities um, that are helping monarchs. And then there is like the citizen science aspect of it where you would seek out, um, you know, the eggs or the, the larvae is what are, you'd mostly, mostly see. So you can find eggs. They're very tiny. If you look very closely, you can find them. Um, but then bring them in into a, into your home, into a, a, container you want to make sure that you have them contained in like a netting structure because mm-hmm. um, they'll pop up i had a, a friend have one escape and popped up in her cupboard <laughs> in her cupboard um she left alone but uh, yeah. yeah and so there's that aspect too what you would do if you wanted to bring them inside and i've um you know you do it when they're very small is you try to look for the, the larva when they're very small so that they are not um you know they have a better chance of not being um Losing the words, help me out. Parasitized. Parasitized, yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you have a better better chance of, of rearing them. You need to feed them, of course, you know, collecting mm-hmm. um, cuttings of, of um, milkweed species and bringing them in in a vase, little water vase and protecting them. They kind of make a mess. So you yeah. want to have a, like they they poop. And so you want to, you know, have something at the bottom of your, your contraption to, to capture that and remove it because you want to maintain a clean environment. Um, but it's really a joy. It takes a couple of weeks, um, you know, to rear them and then hopefully have them, you know, um, metamorphosize into a butterfly. Yeah. There's the option of tagging. I don't know if you guys want to get into tagging. Um, our office has tags available for folks. Um, if they wanted actually to so tag with a little bit of sticker that you would stick very delicately on their wings and um, send them off into the world. And then it's tracked. Um, so if your, your butterfly makes it, to the next destination or is captured again, it's logged. Um, you can yeah. 
So it kind of has to be, it, researchers have to find it in the migration yeah. where they get to. Yeah. So there's not a guarantee your, your tag is going to be found. But our, our four right. Iroquois master gardeners like have tagged a ton the last couple of years. They really yeah. went into that. Yeah. And so I think it was maybe last year, like one of theirs got found down at the overwintering, you know, so it's like, yes, awesome. you know, <laughs> it, it's just something fun to kind of root for your monarch to get there. But I think it's an important, um, it's an important piece of data for those researchers where, how far did this um, animal come from? You know, where, where was it tagged at? You know, what was its path? And that's, that's pretty interesting for them to be able to unpack. So yeah, really fun activity to, to tag them. Um, you know, we've, my family has done a lot of collection and, and um, rearing. You know, my kids love it. It's like the day a monarch, you know, hatches, we, we have one of those little screen structures we just keep on our screened in porch. So even if it gets out of the screen structure, we still get a, see it before it goes. But, you know, in those first hours, it's kind of drying its wings and things. You can go just gently pick it up and take it outside and set it on. We usually set it on the milkweed just to be cool like that. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess one of the one of the problems we've had is we've got too many going at times. And then it's like, gosh, we've picked all our milkweed. Where are we going to get mm. more? And yeah. then when you go out into the world to just grab any milkweed, some of those can be sprayed. So that's another just kind of yeah. challenging it all. It's like, don't get too many going at once where you don't have yeah. milkweed for them or you're going to be spending all week collecting, trying to find fresh, good milkweed. So Yeah, I need every food source handy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they do Very eat a cool. lot. I mean, just like oh, the yeah. caterpillar. You know. And you're yeah. going to be cleaning up a lot too <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. underneath them. But but yeah, it's such a cool kids activity to, to be able to see it from the whole process. It's just... Yeah, even as an adult, like, it's just amazing to watch them form that chrysalis and then come out of that. It's just crazy. Yeah, we um, did it a couple of years ago. I, I've got a couple of, of boys and um, when we were able to release some of ours. So the way you would transport them is you very delicately pin, like their wings are together and you just mm -hmm. carry them very delicately you can, by their wings. And I um, told my oldest, I said, just stand very still. And I put it on his nose. <laughs> and it just like sat on his like you know because then you can feel you know like how mm -hmm. the insect is it just um that's how you get up close and personal right and so like they cool. and they weren't freaked out by it like I, I know my kids and so it wasn't like traumatizing to them but yeah. you know that's how you, you to, to see something from the wild and then like to observe it for all those weeks um you know feed it you know make sure you're meeting all of its needs and then to have it just be like literally in your face and then fly off and it's gone like you watch it you know take take off and um it's a it's a really neat in, informational like process it, it's inspiring my kids are are geek out about it now so Pretty yeah cool. so, so there is some research that suggests like those monarchs we rear are less to less able to migrate then and you know we've kind of struggled with that and that's caused yeah. that's caused us to maybe cut back on how many we we rear but you know, like my big milkweed patch is just right out my back door. So I can look at it like literally every day. Like it's almost, mm -hmm. it's like a path to my car around the back of our garage that I go through every day. And, you know, we just, so many of the, um, the caterpillars that we see in our garden disappear before they ever, you know, form a chrysalis anywhere. Or, I mean, we know, cause it's like, oh, there's another caterpillar on that. Yeah. On that plant. And then it's gone. And I, so I don't know where they're going, but like the fact of the matter is we felt like we just, we weren't getting many out of our garden space anyway. So let's grab a few and at least give a few a chance. So I think probably in the past we did too many. I think there was one summer we did like almost a hundred. That, we wow. that that was the year we were really trying to find milkweed in every corner of the county. That <laughs> not spray yeah, or anything. I bet. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's something to think about. And mm -hmm. I don't know that we, so we don't really know, I don't think from research, like what are all the implications when we humans start to mess with these, these little yeah. guys. But I think it, you know, for both of us, Emily, has left such an impression on our children mm -hmm. that I feel mm -hmm. like that, you know, educating that next generation yeah. and having them have a monarch on their nose yeah. is like more valuable than, you know, one of those caterpillars that could have gotten lost that we then hatched but couldn't migrate quite as well, you know. So yeah. I think that's yeah. something to follow, though, in, in, you know, as more research comes out, like, there's maybe a question of whether we're helping and hurting in that rearing process. So something to think yeah. about. Yeah. Yep. Pros and cons for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a great point. I'm glad you said that because it, it to me is worth a, a few of those trade-offs, right. To, to get my kids passionate about it and to get any kids, like I know they do it at the school too. Um, yeah. You know, to, to be able to 
be that close, you know, to the process, like I said, it, it really can, it, they can internalize it, right? And so then later on, when they can make decisions about, you know, managing the landscape or, um, you know, what they're interested in even, it can, it can be, you know, formative. So. Yeah, I yeah. Think even if it's not even, like the, the monarchs that they get the education on, it's just that intricate relationship of everything. You know, the ecology yeah. of everything going on around us that we don't know what what thing we can change that's in shockwaves up the food chain or across different, you know, diverse groups of species. So, right. Well, and I was, was going to say even adults, too. I mean, we would we would rear them in the, in the extension office and every single employee in the whole building would be like glued to that waiting for the waiting for them to come out of their chrysalis. So it's like. Everybody, I feel like, needs to at least experience that. Well, and if you've never seen a monarch chrysalis, rear one just to see it. Because I tried to photograph this, and I'm not a good enough photographer to catch it, but there's like these little sparkly, almost like kind of things around it. And it's just, it's mind-blowing what happens in there. It is. That that insect goes into mush and comes out as a butterfly. I mean, it's really (laughs) a fascinating process. That's it, like... I know there are scientific explanations for it, right? Like we know that it's horticulturist. Like there's a there we could explain it scientifically, but it's not always required to have that level of understanding to to appreciate and to enjoy like the magic of nature. Like there is because there are some things we cannot explain, right? Um, it's it's just it's just wonder, you know. And yeah, and you can see it, especially. I don't want to give it away to anybody, but um, like when it's ready to. When, when the process is almost done like that, the uh, chrysalis becomes transparent and you can see it like all like wrapped up in there and then it comes out and you just think like, how did that big, beautiful butterfly get in there? You can there? see like, like it's wings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can. Yep. You can see the, the wings kind of all curled up. And if you do um, rear a few, like when they do first emerge, let them dry. Their wings need to dry. So you need to let them, let them alone for a while. Don't get you know too excited. Give them... Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but then you need to release them right away too because they need to go seek nectar and yeah, you know, get outside. Point. Cool. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. There's there's any final questions? I think there's one I missed earlier. Uh, oh, hey, back to uh, boxwood leaf miner. Oh yeah. You know, I was looking that up like real quick there. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, spinosad is is um, something that's recommended for the use. You'll need to follow up a little bit with that. It doesn't have a lot of residual time. Um, keep in mind that's pretty broad spectrum. So, you know, if you're spraying that, that's not not just boxwood miner it's going to impact, but um, definitely um, good early in the season, like right now, to be controlling. So this is the time for control. Um, they also mention imidacloprid, which is a systemic herbicide. As, mm-hmm. as a possible treatment. So that's something that has probably different, a few different application methods you could use. Uh, soil drench is what folks use a lot. Um, but yeah, that's that's going to have more residual effect. That's systemic. The, you know, that's that's probably going to impact other insects. So when you think about what, what are my impacts, uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's what you maybe need to think about. Uh, you know, boxwood is not native. So I don't know how much of our native insect life uses it. That would be a question to maybe answer before you you know, start massively yeah. treating it. But I, you know, to me, it's kind of like, gosh, a non-native that we don't probably don't have a lot of insects really feeding on it. So maybe that is the plant that you would choose that kind of treatment for. But, right. but those are kind of the recommended routes. So very good. Hope that helps, Susan. And keep in mind too, like how extensive is the damage? Like is it does it even warrant control if it's not over a kind of a large enough part of the plant too? That's also something to think about. So okay, let's see. Brenda had a question earlier. Um, I have a crab tree, I'm assuming a crab apple, with one half bloom and the other no bloom this spring. Any ideas? What do you think? Crab apple, half bloom, half not. You know, so, sounds kind of like you're um, some type of environmental damage, you know, when it's like that half of the tree. I know. So, mm-hmm. for, you know, yeah, freezing of flower to... buds. Um yeah. You know, one half of that root system getting chopped off for one reason or another, where that yeah. part of the plant's a little more stressed than the other. Mm-hmm. But those, are, I don't know, any other thoughts? Like, that's kind of what I would think. One of the environmental factors, probably. Yeah. If it's literally like half, like a portion of that's that, that didn't flower, that's what I was thinking too. They're a girdled root on one side or some type of 
damage on that one area of the tree is kind of where I, because usually if it's, if it's a freeze or if it's something like that, it, it would usually be fairly uniform across the tree. Yeah. It would, unless, unless that's kind of the more exposed side sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, that's true. I've, I've seen that that's kind of damage true. pattern from freezing where it's just that more exposed side. That's um, true. Yeah, if one's next to the house. Or yeah, maybe a certain time of day where part of it's still in the shade and the other part would have a nice sunny exposure mm -hmm. that would keep it, you know, just warmer. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. But. Yeah, and I would just keep an eye on it next year, Brenda, and see if it does the same thing, then I think it's probably safe to assume that there's some type of damage or something happening with that part of the tree. Well, yeah, I think I would definitely want to watch it this year. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. a not full canopy or that side of the canopy not having as many leaves, there's an indicator, but even maybe trying to think about uh, what's its twig growth this year compared to last year or one side of the tree compared to the other. Um, yeah. You know, so cool. you know, Emily, were you going to say something? Sorry if I cut you off. No, I, no, it's okay. I agree with all those things. Um, I would say, you know, keep monitoring it and look at the um, foliage growth. If it is um, like frost or early, you know, like um, or late freeze kind of damage or cold, cold related damage, those buds would take a hit sooner than the, the mm -hmm. leaf material, the leaf buds. Mm -hmm. And so if it leaves out, if it looks totally, you know, symmetrical or, or quote unquote normal, um, then that would indicate to me that was, that might have been what happened. Of course, looking at the environmental conditions, like Ryan had indicated, if there was you know some shade or some exposure. Um, if the leaves don't match the other side, then I would consider what's going on with the root system. Um, you know, was, was there disturbance? Did you put in a new bed? Was there some sort of chemical treatment on that mm. that side of the the tree um, that might have you know affected the development? So, um, yeah. Good point. Good point. Awesome. Okay, and then I think we'll we'll end with Susan had a great comment. She said, "Plant those late season bloomers like flocks for the adults to eat nectar from in the late summer." And that's a good tip. We talked about about spring blooms, but yeah. it really is essential to have blooms kind of all season long so that the adults have nectar. So, good point, Susan. Thanks for having that. Yeah. Okay. Any final thoughts, guys, on monarchs and milkweeds before we sign off for the day? I don't know. It's going to be monarch season soon. So be watching right. your gardens. I, yeah. I've seen reports. I haven't seen one myself. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I would say just get ready, everybody. Do what you can. Mm -hmm. Go to a, a monarch release party. I know some, um, you know, that can be pretty magical and pretty fun to go to, too, uh, later in the season. It's different organizations. But, um, yeah, it's going to be, I have a feeling it's going to be a good year. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Our next show is going to be um, June 16th, so in about a month or so. Join us again for our Facebook Live show. I think we're going to talk all about cut flowers, so that's my jam. Happy to <laughs> happy to talk about that. Uh, Emily, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. And then I think we, we added in the chat box, I think, too, don't forget about our Facebook group. We have a Extension Horticulture Facebook group where you can ask questions at any time and post pictures and share things with other gardeners. So definitely check that out and we will see you guys next month. Happy, happy gardening. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks. Bye.